Tonight, we look at the effects of the NSC two-day warning strike. Well, the Trade Union Congress seems to have a different perspective to the position of the Nigerian Labour Congress. We'll be getting those perspectives tonight. Tension ahead of tomorrow's verdict as a presidential election petition court delivers judgment in the presidential election petition tribunal. Hello everyone, welcome to the program. This is Politics Today live on Channels Television. I'm sure Kimare in Abuja, but there's uh, so much to talk about. Tomorrow, the presidential election petition court will deliver judgment in the petitions brought against the victory and the election of Bola Tinubu and the APC after the 2023 presidential election. So we will be live for you. Channel Television will be your eyes on the ground. We'll be covering every area that you need to know as far as that is concerned. From 7 a.m., tune to Channel Television and you will be bringing you up to speed with what is happening in and outside of the courtroom. But of course, let's tell you that what is happening in the Interior Ministry does look to me that a man at the end of affairs seems very passionate. Tonight, correctional facility, the integration of identity, issues of immigration, issues of passport, and a host of other issues get our attention. We will dissect and dig what Balatinobu's plan is in the Interior Ministry. Can they generate funds? What are the issues on the ground? We'll be looking at all of those tonight also. Plus, we'll be getting a feeler of what is happening between the federal government and the Nigerian organized labor as the two-day warning strike is ongoing and the effect is biting because workers have down tools. Well, let's tell you that President Bola Tinubu has landed in India and uh, shortly after he landed, he went straight into having conversations about investment for the interests of Nigeria. The president's spokesperson, Ajuri Ingilale, earlier told Channel's television about how speedily the president got into activities of his meetings on the sideline of the G20 meeting, which the president got an invitation from uh, the leader of India. Um, this was the conversation and the moment where the president was meeting with one of the billionaires and investors willing to invest in Nigeria. I allow you to look at the informal conversation between the president, then you hear from the minister of uh, finance, Wali Edun. I mean, yes. uh, Thank you. Thank you. As I've always been, it is very difficult period, yes. but success is not made of an individual except from a team and I have a good team. Yes. yes. God, God will help you. God will help you. Amen. I'll pray Amen. for that. Thank you, so sir. So that one day we come to Nigeria where we see a, such a big success. I'm looking forward to that. What you are all about, what you are determined to do, is bring investment to Nigeria that will grow the economy and reduce poverty and make life better for Nigerians. Mr. Prakash Hinduja is of the Hinduja brothers. They are a they have assets worldwide of 100 billion dollars, and in America. They have assets of $50 billion. And if I may say so, their net worth is $32 billion. So they're the type of uh, uh, business people that uh, you are keen to meet and you are keen to get their commitment to invest in Nigeria. That's uh, Mr. Wale Edun before him was the president, uh, Balatinubu, in his very first meeting with. Uh, the billionaire, the owner of the Induja Group, uh, which is worth over 10 billion US dollars in asset, including uh, 50 billion dollars in assets in the USA alone, uh, seeking to invest in Nigeria across sectors, including the automobile 
and bus manufacturing through Ashok Leyland, amongst other sectoral opportunities. That is President Tunubu's first sideline meeting in India. Before we get into our very first conversation tonight, let's get to uh, uh, check out some of what is happening across the nation in your political roundup. Former President Goodluck Jonathan says to foster a sense of nationhood among Nigerians, the citizens must move from choosing political alternatives to insisting on alternatives. This is the summation of the former president and the former chairman of the Nigerian Governors Forum, Kaudi Fayemi of Ikiti State, at the 60th birthday celebration of the director of the Center for Alternative Policy Perspectives and Strategy, Professor Udenta Udenta in Abuja. You've read some of the comments of our former leaders. And of course, I will all make it very clear that there is no nation called Nigeria. Yes, it's a geographical entity, it's a country, it's a state that has laws, but there is no nation. My own notion of alternative politics that can lead us to building a better consensus around progress is that you cannot have 37% of the vote and take 100% of the spoils. Deputy Governor of Edo State, Philip Shoibu, has withdrawn the suit he filed at the Federal High Court to stop alleged plots by the State Governor, Godwin Obasaki, to remove him from office. The Deputy Governor stated that the decision to withdraw the suit came after a series of meetings involving himself, Obasaki, and well-meaning citizens of Edo and Nigerians, including party leaders, traditional rulers, and the Archbishop, Benin Archdiocese of the Catholic Church. Mr. Shoibu wrote, I quote, with due respect to these eminent personalities and leaders whose persuasions and persons I cannot ignore, I, Right Honorable Comrade Philip Schreiber, have authorized and instructed my solicitors to withdraw the suit forthwith. End of quote. Governor Abdurrahman Abdurazak Okwa State is taxing the newly sworn in commissioners to let their projects, programs, and actions reflect the current economic reality of the country. Governor Abdurazak was speaking while at the swearing in of 17 commissioners and the secretary to the state government in allowing the state capital. The new Nigerian People's Party, NNPP, says it has obtained an injunction from a Kano State High Court to stop some of its former members who have been expelled from the party from parading themselves as officers of the party. Speaking at a conference in Abuja, the national auditor of the party, Ladipo Johnson, notes that the party has approached the court in order to restore sanity to the party. The party believes that the crisis in the NNPP has been sponsored by some external forces who are scared of the party's profile ahead of the 2027 general election and are now walking round the clock to cause disunity in the party. NNPP is insisting that the presidential candidate of the party, Senator Rabiu Konkoso, remains the national leader of the party. The results of our investigations have made it very clear that some external forces and their shenanigans and their main target, no doubt, is His Excellency, Senator Abiy Musa Konkozo. Ahead of the offices and elections in Imo, Kogi and Bayosa State, the Independent National Electoral Commission has approved the resumption of collection of permanent voters' card, PVCs, for registered voters who could not collect their PVCs before the suspension of the exercise on 5th February 2023 ahead of the last general election. According to a statement by the Commission, the exercise only covers the three states where governorship elections will hold on Saturday 11th November 2023. The PVCs will be available for collection at all INEC local government areas offices in the three states. The controversy in the NNPP seems to be unfolding as uh, the Agbo major led uh, group in the NNPP said today that they have expelled Robbie Kwankunso, the presidential candidate of the party, but as you see there in the political roundup, uh, that has been debunked by uh, the group loyal to Mr. Kwan Kunsa. Now we understand there is a court order stopping uh, the Agbo major group of the NNPP from parading themselves as members of the party. Now, as soon as President uh, Bola Tinobu inaugurated his cabinet, we've seen a few of the ministers get into town and in some ways it's in the ground running. Some of them, what they have done simply is to take a tour around the agencies and parastatists of government under their ministry. One of such is the Ministry of Interior. 
The Minister of Interior, Honorable Olubu Mitunyi Ojo, has been going around town looking at the agencies of government under its purview, which includes the, uh, the in Nigeria Correctional Service. We, we visited the Kujie Correctional Center, the Nigeria Immigration Service. We visited the headquarters in Abuja, the Federal Fire Service. Nigeria Security and Civil Defense Corps, the Civil Defense, Immigration, Prisons, and Fire Service Board, all of these, the man has visited. But there is one thing that's gone viral since Standard Television put together that report of the Minister's Assumption of Office and the tour. I'd like you to listen to what he said when he visited the Immigration's Office. Nobody should come and use agreement or whatever as a booby trap. If you are ready to sit up, Good. If you are not sitting up, then you get out. It's as simple as that. It is unacceptable. And I'm unapologetic about this. I'm very passionate about it. It is unacceptable for Nigerians to wait for months to get passport. For anybody that is interested in passport and can afford it, it's a right, not a privilege to Nigerians. It is a right, not a privilege. And we must look at the whole ecosystem. We must look at the whole world through and be able to fill all loopholes, making sure that once again, the green bag, the green passport becomes a document of pride. The minister joins us live in our studio, Honorable Olubomi Tunji Ojo, the Minister of Interior. Thank you so much, Honorable Minister, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Chef. For having the me. passion there is uh, that video has gone viral since Standard Salvation put for that report of your visit. That shows the level of your passion. For a moment, you were taking off the Ministry of uh, uh, the Blue Economy, and uh, a lot of people thought, uh, I mean, there were talks about what you will do in that ministry. But when this came, it does look like you've been thinking and planning for this all your life. Is that the case? Well, it's about, uh, thank you, Sharon, and uh, thank Nigerians for um, this opportunity. And may I especially thank the President, Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, for the opportunity of service. You know, it's a unique opportunity that he has given to us to contribute our quota to national development. We do, I personally do not take that for granted, and it's an opportunity for us to make a difference and um, to contribute our quota and make sure that um, Nigeria once again regains its place in, in the Committee of Nations, the place of pride, you know, that uh, we stand for as the biggest black nation on earth. Having said that, well, for me, it's about uh, the passion, it's about understanding the task ahead, it's about keying into the renewed hope agenda of the president. The renewed hope agenda is very detailed, you know, it's very comp it's very detailed, yet simple you know, for for us, and it's like a Bible, it's like what it's like a guide, like a dictionary, you know, in terms of what we need to do to solve problems facing Nigerians, day-to-day -day problems. And that's what we're trying to do in the Ministry of Interior. Interesting. You are so passionate. You say anybody that is not fitting in should get out. That's true. I mean, it does look to me that you have found out some rot in the system. Can you give us just a snippet of what you have found out? How bad are things? Well, um... I always say this, God gave me my eyes to be in front, not to be at the back, because God wants me to look, you know, he wants me to look ahead and look for solutions, you know. Um, talking about the rots, talking uh, Nigerians are not interested in the rots, as far as I'm concerned. Nigerians are not interested in the problem statement. Nigerians are interested in solutions. But well, how know? do you fix it and if you don't know what the problem is? We, we know the problems. We have, the last two weeks has been dedicated to getting these problems. Understanding the whole ecosystem, as I said, knowing where the issues are, understanding the bottlenecks. But that's not what Nigerians want to hear from me. Nigerians don't want to hear problems. Nigerians want to see solutions. Nigerians want to be able to go into passport offices. Nigerians want, they want to be able to get their passport at their convenience. Nigerians don't want to travel kilometers before they get things done. Nigerians don't want to risk their lives on the road just because they need a, um, a, 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 a security document called passport. As I said, it's a right. It's not a privilege. Nigerians want that right to be actually theirs, not by virtue of somebody offering you your right. It is the right of Nigerians that are interested to have passport. So as far as I'm concerned, the problem statement is meant for us as administrators to understand, to digest. But what Nigerians want to see is solution. 
And that is what the president has constantly told us mm. at every forum. He has always told us with, at every given opportunity that, hey, I didn't bring you on board. None of you ministers were brought, brought on board to come and give excuses. I brought you on board to come and bring solutions to the but table. That's what you should, we should be expecting from your ministry. Exactly. No excuses, performance, and delivery. Exactly. Taking a cue from President Bola Metinubu, who has said, no matter what it is, I asked for this mandate, and Nigerians have given me this mandate. The president gave us the rare opportunity, the privilege of a lifetime, to serve our motherland, to serve this country. He didn't give us this privilege to give excuses. He gave us the privilege to, for us to be able to bring solutions on board. And that's what we Let's talk about solutions now. And the passport matter is a very key one. Uh, I mean, even outside of this country, Nigerians renewing their, visa, uh, their passport is hellish. Now, let's talk about Nigerians wanting to renew their international passport. You said that it is not a privilege. It is a matter of right for yes. every citizen of Nigeria who wants to carry the green passport to be able to carry it in, uh, in, uh, with, with ease. Pride. Uh, do you know how long it takes? Maybe I should give you an understanding. Because some of us who are ordinary Nigerians, we know what it takes us. It takes a minimum of three months to get a passport out. Since you got into office, what assurances are you giving ni to Nigerians? Shem, can I tell you this? You said ordinary Nigerian. We are all ordinary Nigerians. But I'll you are an honorable minister. I'll give you... You are just uh, one out of the about 40 of you. I'll give you... I'll, I'll, so you are not ordinary like I'll us. give you an example. My own daughter, my own daughter waited for months to get passport, even as a serving member of the House of Rep. I feel what Nigerians feel. And that is one of the reasons why we're saying, in line with the directive of the president, it can no longer be business as usual. We have anal critically analyzed all the scenarios, the whole walkthrough, the whole process, from the point of going online to fill the form on the, on, online, to the point of payment, to the point of picking a date, to the point of biometrics, to the point of issuance of passport. We have gone through the whole process. How long and we you understand. Yeah, yeah. If it takes about just three, three, just, six just months, a minute, yeah. and we understand the service providers that are involved. We have analyzed the roles of the service providers. We have also analyzed the roles of immigration service. And we have been able to see one or two things that we need to put right. So that Nigerians once again can smile, knowing fully well that the green passport is a thing of pride that you should get with dignity, you should get with ease. And I have said this, it is completely, it's, it's not excusable for any Nigerian to be treated with disrespect, either in Nigeria or in diaspora. That's the truth. But Minister, uh, what are you doing to shrink the wait time? How long do you think, since you have gotten to office now, do you think it should take naturally to get an international passport out? Well, I have to be very categorical. And this is the instruction that I've given to the immigration service. I do not see anything in the short term. I don't think clearing out backlogs, it shouldn't take more than two weeks. To get an international passport that's, out? That's my fair assessment. There are those who believe that it is actually insecure for Nigeria to put issuance of international passport in the end of private sector. There are private sector in the mix. This is getting out, is a security document for some reasons. Because it's an identity typical to every citizen. Putting it uh, uh, in the hands of a third party because we understand that the immigration service and the passport unit of the immigration service cannot fulfill that mandate all by itself, it has to engage a private sector to do that. Are you still going ahead to make sure, that, to, to see that that continues? Or what are you doing? Well, let me, let me tell you this very clearly. I don't think that assertion is completely right. And I think, let's be fair to the immigration service. You know, we need to criticize them when we need to criticize them. But nevertheless, we need to be fair to them. The immigration service issues passports. That's the fact. Do we have vendors, private sectors in, between, in the mix. For instance, on the issue of production and supply of booklets. Yes, we do. That's what I'm talking about. Hold on. That's for booklet. 
Immigration service is responsible for personalization. And I said something in, I mean, when I went to immigration service, I said we're reviewing all this vis-a-vis -vis security risk, national interest, and so many issues, looking at the agreements and looking at how to solve this problem. But the simple truth I want to assure you, and I, that's what I think Nigerians should be comfortable with, is the fact that by the grace of God, we give them all the assurance of His Excellency the President that we will unbottle our bottlenecks. That's number one. And number two, we will unbottle these bottlenecks without jeopardizing or sacrificing national security. You can be rest assured of that. You said Nigerians going forward will be proud to hold the green passport. Yes. Uh, and uh, the, the Minister for uh, Digital Economy has been heavily criticized when at some point it was attributed to have said, oh, the passport, the green passport is what not, uh, is what less considering what, how people perceive and, I mean, you are the Minister of Interior. In the United States, is the Ministry of Homeland. That is the equivalent of that ministry. In terms of giving Nigerians the pride of place as a citizen of this country, what are you doing in that respect? Number one, we're doing a lot. I mean, we have a lot in the pipeline. And as I said earlier today on the program, I said very clearly, we're coming up with our work plan and we're going to come up with KPIs, Key Performance Indicators, and we're going to have our timelines and we're going to, do, we're going to carry the civil society and, um, of course, the media along. We want Nigerians to be able to judge us. By virtue, Nigerians should be able to, to mark our scorecard. We should be able to give us a scorecard after every quarter. This is what we, what we aim to achieve under the leadership of the president. So number one thing that I think we need to do is that first of all, as Nigerians, we need to learn to treat ourselves with respect. And that can be seen, as I always say, the first um, image maker of this, of this country are immigration officers. Non-foreigners want to come to Nigeria. They, they apply for visa. Who do they see at that point, immigration officers? When they come into Nigeria at the airport, the first point of contact, immigration officers. We need to learn to treat ourselves with a bit of respect. Treat Nigerians know fully, knowing fully well that being in uniform does not give you the opportunity, does not give you the right to abuse and trample on the right of average Nigerians. That's the one. Then number two, we must also do our best, as I said earlier today, remove, if possible, to, to the barest minimum, we must re remove human contact. That's the truth. This is, era, this is 2023. This is the era of technology. I'm an IT person. I've, do, I've done IT, information technology, all my life. You know, this is 2023. There is absolutely no reason why the, the human factor should play such a critical role in some of these things. For instance, I'll give you an example. Where does corruption set in in terms of issue of passport? People go to immigration offices to be able to go and do uh, biometrics. biometrics. A lot of people will have to pay to lobby to even get a date to do some of these things. These are things that can be automated through a simple queuing system, queuing solution application. We can do all these things. And basically, we can also, <laughs> that most of our post offices all around, I have told the immigration service, if there's a need for us to inc increase our front offices, for instance, there are, we have post offices all around, we could go into partnership with post offices and be able to use those places as even enrollment centers. It will interest you, maybe Lagos has only four enrollment centers also. This is, a, this is a state of about over 20 million people. It's unacceptable anywhere in the world. So we can make use of our post offices. We can even go into partnership with some of our financial institutions, the banks and whatever, and be able to see how to bring this solution closer to the people, that people don't need to travel, people don't need to kill. When there is scarcity, there is always tendency for corruption because people cannot wait on the queue so they have to show on the queue so but, you but we have to digitalize the whole place mm -hmm. and we have to also decentralize the whole enrollment system we have to decentralize the whole enrollment system and make it at least people can walk in into their uh, into the po nearest post office people can walk into maybe financial institutions and so many others we're still playing with so many ideas we we were to hold a meeting today but we're unable to because of um the, the strike, but I'm sure that on Thursday we'll be holding a meeting myself and immigration service and the service providers to be able to come up, come out effectively mm -hmm. with definite timeline, with definite solutions to this. But well, I can you assure you, to next? we will definitely, I'm passionate about this, I'm committed to this, because the president is committed to this. The president is worried. He feels the pains of Nigerians. He's worried that Nigerians 
should not see a right as a privilege. He is bothered. He is concerned. He is passionate about this. And as a minister in this government, it is my responsibility to make sure that I help the president to fulfill his aim of making sure that he brings Suko to an average Nigeria. So two weeks, he said, Nigeria, I mean, within the next few weeks, we should, be a, we should see a situation where the backlog has been... Well, what we're trying to do... And in two weeks, you should be able no, to... Let, 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 let me say this very clearly. What we're trying to do is that I have given them instruction. I need to know the number of backlogs that we have in every passport office. That is number one. We need to know. And within a specific period, we need all this backlog taken care of. Henceforth, after clearing this backlog, no Nigerian should wait for more than two weeks. Because they, so say, far, yeah, they say that there is no enough um, uh, 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 materials to, to get. That's what you hear. And they will say, oh, uh, the reason I, you I, cannot I, get dates. In fact, when you apply online, they'll give you a date of maybe next year. No, before, be, because before, that is what so, I'm saying. Those are the issues. No, these are the things I'm telling you, Shane. Because the demand outweighs the supply. That scarcity, indirectly, when the demand is more than the supply, where you have four, I think just about four, if I'm not wrong, about four centers in Lagos, a, a state of over 20 million people, is unacceptable. So the four centers are obviously overstretched. I know, and Kenya. No, I think there are about four. Okay. You know? so, but now it, they're overstretched. So by virtue of that, because Nigerians are desperate, they want to get this thing. Mm -hmm. They want to get their right. So automatically corruption comes in. So we, when we remove that, when we decentralize the whole process, then we remove the incentive for corruption. When you remove the incentive for corruption, definitely things will fall in line and people will be able to have this with, maximum, with, with the easiest of ease. Because identity, uh, it's also very mind-boggling how Nigerians will have to be bothered and pressured to carry different identity cards. There is international passport, there is a national ID, there is a driver's license, and all of these agencies of government are getting your data and they are not being able to coordinate it. Is the NIMSI, the Nigerian Information uh, Management, uh, Nigerian identity, identity Management, national, uh, identity uh, management. Uh, national Identity Management, is it under your purview? Yes, it's just been moved to Ministry of Interior. And this is part of the thinking of government, you know, which, which to me makes a lot of sense because when you look at even in, in, in South Africa, when you look at South Africa, when you look at Kenya, when you even look at uh, Pakistan, when you look at the U.S., when you look all over, it is normally, you know, identity management is normally domiciled in, um, in under the Ministry of Interior. Interior. It's always like that. So it's a security issue. It's, it is. Are you thinking of how NIN, can be a standardized identity. No, Just like you have in the United States already or in some other climes where every Nigerian must have an identity. Uh, I mean, every citizen, rather, in the U.S., in other climes, you have an identity, your social security number, which allows you to be able to have access to social facilities and welfare, welfare facilities in the country. But in Nigeria, you have different identities. How, what are you thinking in that line to, for a, a, a standardized identity for every Nigerian? Well, let me say this. There are two different things, and I have to say this. Number one, are Nigerians entitled to carry two, three, four identities? Yes, they are. Let's get that straight. Even in the U.S., even in the U.K., you can have your passport, you can have your um, uh, driver's license, you can have whatever identity. There's no law that says you can't carry more than one or two identities. But what you're talking about is unification of um, the, data. the data. That's yeah. what you're talking about, mm -hmm. harmonization of data. Mm -hmm. And we're passionate about that. As part of our mandate, as part of what, um, what we, we want to do as objective things we want to achieve, I call it SPOC, single point of contact for data harmonization. People should be able, we should be able to harmonize our data, including the banks, including um, road safety, including um, even INEC, including uh, 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 anything that involves biometric data. NIMSI, because by law, it is written in the NIMSI, and NIMSI is responsible for the management of identity. Identity management is responsibility of NIMSI. But we are... Today, I just had a meeting with the DG, the new DG of NIMSI, very, very brilliant and intelligent lady. We sat down today to come up with plans of harmonizing the data such that it will reduce cost to government in terms of 
enrollment cost and whatever. That's number one. Then number two, it gives us a single point of access, you know. Then number three, it also makes issue of identification quite easy, you know. And number four, it also helps us in national planning and national development. So we know who you say, we know that you are who you say you are. And also, if you have a functional name, as I've always said, that is, that is responsive, that you trust the integrity, whatever, it can even help us to even, it can even save us of even the money we are spending on biometric enrollment, even in passport. It can help us in biometric enrollment, even in um, voters' uh, uh, INEC, INEC registration and couple. So it helps government. So, so Minister, um, our children or people are from birth, because you have your birth registration if you're born in the hospital. Yeah. Uh, so are, are every Nigerian at birth, are they, do, would they be able to have access to the NIN? to have an identity, mm -hmm. or at what point will a Nigerian be able to have the identity? No, those are part of the nitty-gritty of what we're trying to uh, work on, because at best, I don't think that is possible yet, you know, because of always, because of the biometric issues, you know, so that at best, no, not, not at this moment. So I imagine that know. every Nigerian that is born to have its own identity. No, definitely, that's under National Population Commission, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're responsible for registration of birth, and even death, you know, that's National Population Commission. And whatever. But the most important thing is, I don't think we need to put too many things, you know, um, on the burner at the same time. You know, the first thing we need to do is, first of all, how do we make sure that, I think we have over 100 million, about 100 million uh, IDs, you know, on the database, in the database of NIMSI. How do we make sure that they are clean, they are dependable, they are verifiable, and of course, they, are, they, are, they, are, they have integrity. So once we first of all clean the database and we're sure of that, then we're not talking about harmonization of all available database, making sure of cross matches, and ensuring that we're all on the same page and on the same template. Then after that, we can now start thinking of other solutions. But I think we should take it one after uh, the other. Let me, let me take you quickly on two issues before we wrap up. One is expected quota. And the idea of expected quota is for the purpose to enable employers to recruit uh, employment opportunities that are not available, uh, in, that the capacity are not available by Nigerians to get people out of the country. But this has usually and oftentimes been misused by companies. Some companies who are not owned by Nigerians and jobs that Nigerians can do usually bring, they bring expatriates to the country to take the jobs of Nigerians. And it's under the purview of the Ministry of the Interior. Yeah. What are you going to do about that? Well, I'll tell you what we're doing, because uh, since I came on board, I've seen some uh, re um, requests you know, for approval of expatriate quotas, some I think Nigerians can do. And it's all about the will to do what is right. Then number two is that we have to also try to enhance our requirements, you know, for um, approval of expatriate quota. For me, uh, it's about doing what is right for the benefit of this country. Any job that you think Nigerians can do should not be outsourced to foreigners. That's the only way we create jobs for our people. That's number one. Then number two, we must also un uh, understand that even when there are special skills that we do not have, as part of um, the as part of the of granting this of the expatriate quota, there must also be what we call knowledge transfer because we can't continue to use foreigners for those particular skills forever. So we have to think about okay, we want to give you this approval for two years. For within these two years, you should have been able to transfer these skills to um, a Nigerian, you know, over a period of time and whatever. So we are looking at the whole policy. It's part of what we're trying to do, looking at the whole policy and probably amending the policy to make sure that the rights of Nigerians to employment are mm. fully protected and um, unemployment in Nigeria is reduced to the barest minimum. And at the end of the day, we make it almost, uh, almost which we discourage um, companies. It, right. it will interest you, it, not even foreign companies alone. Some of the expatriate quota requests that I've gotten are even from Nigerian companies. Indigenous companies? Yes, indigenous companies. Owned by Nigerians? Yes, owned by Nigerians, requesting for some... Jobs that are possibly that I know that Nigerians are can do. You know, for, I, don't, I wouldn't want to mention some of the details, but ridiculous uh, request. But nevertheless, yeah. we have to understand, as I have said, Minister. that we have to be fair yeah. to Nigerians, and we must make sure that where, in rare instance, when these skills are not available in house, and yeah. there's evidences that the evidences that these skills are not available, 
Once we are even approving the expat expatriate quota, we must attach what we call knowledge transfer policy. You must be able to transfer this policy to Nigerians. I don't see why an expatriate should do a job for two years, renewable for another two years, for another. Some have done jobs for, uh, they've renewed more than two, three times, six times. That's about six years, eight years. Are you telling me that no Nigerian is intelligent enough to, to, to take up that, to take up that responsibility if we are to talk and well. So we have to look at all these things. I mean, there are a lot of uh, um, uh, responsibility under your of office, and if you go on about that, it's going to we're going to spend the whole day. But there's one more question I'd like to ask you, although I would like uh, to have asked you about uh, the NSCDC, but that's going to be for another day. But if my final question to you is about the congestions in the correctional facilities, who are popularly called the prisons in Nigeria. It is mind-boggling, and you have said also in that when you are making your tour that it is not supposed to be so. What are the immediate steps you're taking, just for us to wrap up? Okay, number one, we're, we're working very closely. I have to give you one, some statistics, first of all. The Nigerian prison, in Nigerian Correctional Service, we have over 80,000 inmates at the moment. And of course, most of our correctional centers are overstretched. For example, I'll give you the example of uh, Kuje Correctional Center, built for 520 people. Today has 862, no, has 682 people. You know, that's obviously over, over, capacity. over capacity. And that's the way it is in most of our, our correctional centers. And it will interest you that more than 70%, from various statistics, we said they said 76%, 78%. But I just want to be modest and say 70% of these inmates are awaiting trials. That is mind boggling. And it comes down to our judiciary. And that is, and that, and uh, that is not sustainable. Yeah. So, what we're trying to do is to work very closely with the Ministry of Justice and, of course, the Legal Aid Council, you know, and the Nigerian Correctional Centers to be able to look at possibilities and areas in line with the Administration of, Administration of Criminal Justice, SCGS. So, so, let's see how we can decongest while following the law, making sure that we don't run f f uh, fall of the law. That's number one. Then number two is that when we look at the, um, Nigeria, the Correctional Service Act, there are two responsibilities for correctional centers. Number one is the, cost, uh, is the custodial service and the non-custodial service. But we interest you that all we have working in Nigeria today is the custodial service. The non-custodial part of the law has not yet been implemented, and that's what we're looking at implementing. What that involves is that, okay, it's not everybody that should be in correctional centers, like we have overseas. Some community people, service. Some, service, yeah. some of them, home service, trackers, and clear, you know, some of these. So we're looking at that particular affair because we look at your, your, also your offense, especially if it's a waiting trial, non some petty offenses, and we'll, we'll now be able to put you in non-custodial centers, maybe at home, or whatever, and be able to track you, and some community services. So there are a lot of reforms that we're trying to make because this is something I'm, the, the, the correctional service is one I'm extremely passionate about because it deals with human rights of people, and it deals with the future of people. Mm. These correctional centers should be correctional in nature, not a place for condemnation, not a place you go and you become hopeless, not a place that you go and you become lifeless, not a place that you go and you become featureless. That is not our dream. That is not the Nigeria of our dream. And President Bola Tinubu has always said it, it's hope for all, renewed hope for all Nigerians, yeah. regardless of where you are, regardless of how vulnerable you are, regardless of how strong you are. Once you are in Nigeria, it's renewed hope all all the way and we believe from the ministry of interior right. that message must be made loud and clear even to our inmates the minister for interior honorable olubumi tunjiojo many thanks for coming Thank you and i wish you the very best is your early days uh one cannot get too critical about because you you just hit on the ground and i hope for, hopefully you will get things running i wish you all the very best thank you uh, honorable minister thank you and god bless you thank you we take a break, everyone, and when we come back, the first day of the NLC strike. But what is the TUC doing? We'll be speaking with the president of the Trade Union Congress, Festus Osifo. After now, come and see Thank you so much, everyone. I'm being joined by the president of the Trade Union Congress, Mr. Festus Osifo. Today is uh, the first day of the um, NLC two-day one in strike. But is the Trade Union Congress part of it? The NLC last week has announced that it will embark on two-day one in strike to rain home on the federal government. They need to uh, move in the direction of the negotiation over the aftershocks of 
the removal of fuel subsidy. Let's speak with uh, the TUC president, Comrade Fasos Osifo. Thank you so much, Comrade, for joining us. Thank you so much, Sheo. Good evening, Nigerians. Thank yeah. you so much. Is the TUC part of the warning strike? Ah, uh, yeah, no. Um, you know, we had our National Executive Council meeting on Sunday. So um, at the end of the meeting, so uh, from the TUC angle, so um, we deliberated on it. In fact, first of all, before the NEC meeting, we had a NAC meeting. So NAC is the National Administrative Council meeting. So we mm. had discussions around that. Then we now had to move it to the NEC. So what we agreed on, I mean, the communique has since come out since yesterday. So um, we had all the issues spelled out, uh, but we said that we should continuously engage government. Because one thing that we also observed, and one thing that we have been doing over time, is that when after each meeting, so as TUC, what we normally do is that we continue engagement even beyond the, the eyes of the camera. So um, if you recall, the last formal meeting we had, so after that meeting, you know, government announced um, the issue of the 5 billion, 5 billion naira to be given to the state, that today they have released 2 billion. First of all, we said that the sum was quite small. In fact, they, they consulted us. We had some discussions around that. We queried that sum, and we also queried the vehicle that should be used. That so it's not as if you're not aware of the disbursement of that money? I, yes, we, I, I mean, well, they you told us, yes, of course, they told us that this is what they want to do and this is the channel they want to use. You remember, when they wanted to do the conditional, I mean, use the social register, we kicked against it. We said, no, you cannot use the, that register because we clearly don't know the people that are in that register. So for us, we now pushed that, okay, anything you want to do, you must have a means that is transparent. So then I came and said, okay, the best thing that they have discovered for now is that they should push it through the state. We also queried, I mean, we queried two things. Number one, you remember all the monies that have been pushed to the state before now, uh, that at the end of the day, most of these interventions, like the COVID intervention, we did not know how it was spent. So we asked, how will this be monitored? So they told us that they were going to set up a national monitoring team on this. In fact, initially, the sum they were contemplating was even smaller than this. But we told them that that will not go anywhere. Even the five billion, we also our, our position has also been that it will that is not far-reaching enough. But one thing we have been trying to do behind the cameras and behind the scene, because for us it's not sufficient for us to just uh, issue letter to government and we just go to meetings that you have press. Then at the end of the day, we go. I mean, we shy away. No, what Nigeria wants is solutions. What Nigeria wants is results. So that was why, even within this period. We have been engaging the management of NNPC. If you remember, a few weeks down the line, I mean, a few weeks ago, they announced the, the, the relationship between or the MOU that was signed between NNPC and NIPCO. We played a very, TUC played a very, strong, um, uh, a very strong push on that, a very strong role on that to ensure that that was done. The reason was this. If you remember, Shane, I was in your program here at the time, and we were talking about CNG, CNG, CNG. So, and we we're talking about conversion kits. There is no way you could have conversion kits. There is no way you could place conversion kits on vehicles without the enabling infrastructure. So that MOU that they signed was to provide some level of infrastructure. For us, we also told them that what you have done is like scratching the surface that you still need to do more. So conclusively, and coming back to your question again, for us in TUC, I mean, uh, we are the, you know, in... In industrial relation, we have a toolbox. And in the toolbox, there are consultations, there are dialogue, there are push, there are confrontations. So any of these that is being used, the major thing is the end game. So for us in TUC and our counterpart in NLC, it is about Nigerians. It's about the end game. So you are so not part of this warning strike? I know. You did not agree on the warning strike? I know. We, we... It was NLC did this on their own. Uh, yeah. First of all, first of all, there wasn't a conversation between us on the best direction to go. There wasn't a conversation. So we heard it in the media that NLC has declared a two days one strike. So they didn't carry we you were already we were already planning to have our neck meeting. You know, we are we are independent uh, trade uh, trade centers as well. So they do, they are not they don't have the obligation that they must carry us along. Same, we don't also have that obligation. But for the sake of Nigerians, 
we try to synergize and we try to work together. So for me, I think that the part they have taken, it's a good one, it's very okay. I mean, it's all about the interests of Nigerians. But for us, we felt that in the last one month, some of the things that you have been seeing in the media that government has been pushing out has been as a result of the push that TUC have been making behind the scene. Are those things enough? The answer is no. Are they far reaching? The answer is no. Are we, do, do we have a lot of jobs to do? Things about, like today, uh, you know, what has been given to the state? Can you account? Can they account for it? So that was why in our next meeting, when we asked all this, we felt that the fact that we have been pushing government behind the scene and they have been acting, but I bet not that fast, we would push them further and we will push them. I mean, so we, we, the NEC mandated the national leadership to continue that push behind the scene. Like, for example, one of the resolutions we reached was that we are going to set up a, a task force across the six geopolitical zones that will be made up of the national officers <coughs> who are going to work with the state council to be sure the politics we are talking about today is not sufficient. But even as abysmal as it is, are they getting to the right people? Are they getting to the right so people? So you will so, monitor? Yes, we are, we are setting up that task force across the six geopolitical zones to monitor the disbursement. Why we are still pushing government to do more? So what would you do if you discover any discrepancy? Yeah, at any state that we discover that it don't, it's not getting to the people, you know, we have state executives all around. We are going to pick a soft state. We will pick at them and we will get them to do what is right. Well, because it's not sufficient for you to collect this from federal government, even when we are shouting that this is not su sufficient for the people and you will divert some of them. So we have the instrument and we have the, the resources to be able to do that monitoring to be sure that it gets to the people. There was an engagement with, it, uh, with the Ministry of Labor yes. because the minister had a press conference yesterday and uh, we, I mean, there is a communication from the Ministry of Labor that there seems to be a two-week uh, uh, timeline giving between the Labor and the, uh, the Ministry, of, uh, Ministry of Labor and the federal government. What is this about? Uh, yes, you know, yesterday, I mean, we were invited yesterday, you know, we got a letter that because as a fallout of the neck of uh, NLC and the fallout of the neck of TUC, that they saw it in the media and that they are inviting us. So when that happened, so we went there, we had a conversation with the minister and the minister of state as well as the, permanent, uh, the directors in the ministry. So from the, from the TUC's neck, so one of the fallout was that let us press government for additional one week. Why, if you remember, there was also an issue we had in Lagos, the issue of Ritian. Uh, Ritian is an affiliate of uh, TUC. Why NURTW is an affiliate of NLC? So we had an issue in Lagos where the Lagos state government shut down uh, the operations of these two trade unions. So for us, we didn't find it funny. So we issued a two weeks ultimatum from TUC that if Lagos state government refused to do the needful, because there's also a, a judgment from the National Industrial Court that if they don't do the needful, that by the end of 14 days, that we are going to shut down Lagos state. So that was what came out from the TUC's uh, meeting. Then part of that as well was also that in seven days, let's press government to bring about some of, I mean, to improve on what they are currently doing, to move into the issues related to CNG, to move into the issues relating to even tax exemptions. Because we were told in one of our meetings that they are going to give tax holidays to people around the minimum wage, for, both from private and the public sector. But today, we have not seen the implementation of that. Then we looked at all these in our next meeting. If you remember, Sheung, states have been making announcements on what they are going to do for the federal, for the state workers. Mm -hmm. We have not heard anything at all for the federal workers because majority of our members, from director, from grade level when you enter the ministry, to the directors across the federal and all states, they are members of Association of Senior Civil Servants, who is an, that, that is an affiliate of TUC. So it affects us directly at all. So all these, we are pushing for one week to get them done. But the minister now appealed to us that they, they, that they are going to present a memo to council mm. and that the Federal Executive Council it will not meet uh, this week because the president is not around, but that he's going to work behind the scene and to ensure that in the next FEC meeting, which will most likely be next week, that he will present that memo and that they will have some announcement to make. So he now appealed that we should give them two weeks for these issues to be resolved. Right. So when we looked at it, we felt, okay, we can also so you have an agreement. Two weeks, that's what you are giving the federal yes, government. Yes, correct. Do you think that they are listening? Uh, from what the minister said, you know, this is the first time we are meeting with the minister. And in our style, 
we give the benefit of doubt. This is the first time we are meeting with uh, uh, Right Honorable Simon Lalong and uh, the Minister of State, uh, Ministry of Labor and Employment. So they told us that we should give them two weeks that uh, they will get back to us. So right. we, we have acceded to that. Let's wait for the next two weeks and see what happens. If not, we take it to the next level. Uh, President, um, what is happening in uh, Port Harcourt about IGP and Ando? You are threatening Pengasad. I'm interested that you have uh, two hats that you're wearing. You are also the president of Pengasad. Yeah, correct. That you are withdrawing your workers uh, from these organizations. Why? Uh, yes, we've already done, I mean, the withdrawal has already been done. Uh, the, the, I think the news from the media is a bit belated because what happened was that uh, we just heard yesterday that uh, Oando is buying 100% uh, stake uh, in OML 60, 61, 62, and 63. Like they are buying the stick. Uh, but now, when you are doing that, what of the workers? We have about 3,000 workforce in that establishment. What they have done, I was quite happy when I listened to your earlier guest, the Minister of Interior, when he was talking about the issue relating to expatriate quarter. You know, expatriate quarter, one of the areas that they have abused expatriate quarter today is the oil and gas. But we have been standing up to them, and we have been sending a lot of them back. So now, what Ajib did was that they... They, they were quickly relocating their expatriates over the weekend. Then on Monday, they made the announcement without recourse to the employees who are our members. We have over 3,000 members of Pengasan in Egypt. So it was a spontaneous reaction that came from the branch as of yesterday. So all we are saying is that both now, Oando, they must come to negotiation table and tell us what they are going to do with our members. All right. Uh, because uh, the fear is that in all of this, the interest and the plight of the poor needs to be considered. Absolutely. And uh, no uh, things that will cause further pain to the Nigerian poor Absolutely. Uh, should be. And uh, you worried, just a final one in 30 seconds, uh, the political inference is being drawn in all of these. There are now political parties who are saying, uh, some of these actions are politically instigated. Uh, yeah, so those were some of the reasons we from TUC were also trying to look at it, look at the broader picture. Mm -hmm. uh, that, because as of last week, we had some inkling that the election, the presidential election petition tribunal will be delivering judgment within this week or maximum next week. So we also factor that into the calculations yeah, that we did. Uh, because for us, we must have a country first before we can push for any issue. President of the Trade Union Congress, uh, Comrade Festus Osifo, thank you so much indeed for your time. Thank you so much. And I wish you the very best thank you for as you fight for the interests of the Nigerian people thank you so and push much. government to do the right thing. Yeah, the media will support and be behind you also. Thank you so much. Thank you so much indeed for your time you. tonight. You. But that's our show for tonight, everyone. Brace up, everyone, because tomorrow at 7 a.m., Channel Television will be your eyes and your ears on the ground, bringing you all the details that you need to know as far as the verdict from the presidential election petition court is concerned. Bringing you all of that because this is the headquarters of politics in the nation. Thank you so much everyone for watching. I'm Sean Wakimale. I'll see you tomorrow again. Bye for now.